Hello everybody and welcome to our Thorny Issues Live on the subject of how many rhinos do we need to save? My name is Cathy Dean, I'm CEO of Save the Rhino International and I'm coming up to my 20th year at the organisation. Um, we are joined today by people from all, literally all over the world. I'm really pleased to see that we've got uh, a viewers or audience members from Africa, from rhino range states, including Botswana, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia, and South Africa. And we also have viewers from India and Indonesia uh, for the Asian rhino range states. Uh, we, our biggest audience is from the UK and Europe, but we also have people joining us from USA, Canada, and Mexico, and from Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore. And I want to thank all of our audience. I know finding uh, time zone uh, differences uh, means that some of you are watching this at very stri strange times of day. So thank you for joining. Thank you for your interest in rhino conservation. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel very shortly. But I wanted just to um, to set the, the scene. Uh, so it's quite important, I guess, that we're all starting with a, a basic level of knowledge. We had a question in from Joanna in the UK who asked how many of each rhino species we are actually we have actually got in the wild at the moment. So uh, from smallest to largest numbers, Javan rhinos, it's generally reckoned that there are about 74 all in one park in Indonesia. Sumatran, or our best estimate is that there are fewer than 80 animals scattered mainly in uh, the north of Sumatra in uh, Gunung Loisa National Park, in Wei Kambas National Park, and a very few in, um, uh, in Kalimantan, also in Indonesia. Greater one horned rhinos, we have about 3,600 found these days in India and Nepal. Black rhinos, Latest figures are somewhere between 5,300 and 5,600, with the biggest four range states being Kenya, Zimbabwe, Namibia, and South, South Africa. And then we come to the white rhinos, and here's where it gets interesting, and I'm not going to be able to give you a figure. The last best official estimate was that there was somewhere between 17 and 19,000. But earlier this year, there was uh, an update, an important update from Kruger National Park that numbers were substantially uh, down, partly due to poaching, also due to the drought and effects on breeding performance. On the other hand, uh, private rhino owners in South Africa have had an excellent uh, record of breeding and very, very little poaching. And until official figures are compiled at the end of this year for the next CITES conference of the party, I think it's quite difficult to say how many white rhinos we think Africa has. Um, so with that caveat, um, let me uh, turn to introduce the panel and I'm going to ask each member just to briefly in say what their involvement in rhino conservation is. And to start with a description, a very short description of what what's your interpretation of how many rhinos do you think we need? What does rhino conservation success look like. So first I'm going to ask Ben Akita from Save the Elephants in Kenya. Ben, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Cathy, and uh, thank you so much for giving us this chance to talk about rhinos. Um, my name is Ben Okita. I work for Save the Elephants, and uh, I also co-chair the African Elephant uh, Specialist Group of the IUCN. And uh, I've been involved in rhinos for many years, since 1996. And uh, that time I was an undergraduate uh, student. And uh, my studies have also been in rhinos. I'm still involved in rhinos, uh, um, uh, working with the Rhino Steering Committee at Kenya Wildlife Service. And uh, I had an opportunity to work with um, uh, Kenya, rhinos, well, Kenya, Kenya, Kenya Wildlife Service on rhino matters as the head of rhino conservation in Kenya. And during that time is when I can say that I saw what I can describe as success in uh, rhino conservation. And success here was uh, building on the foundations that you know our predecessors as uh, rhino coordinators and the work that uh, the private sector, the government, the communities, the local governments have been doing for rhino conservation, you know, to turning things in a way that numbers of births now exceeded uh, deaths. 
And when uh, we had those uh, surpluses, we were uh, in a position now to move animals from where they were enclosed in small areas, what we call sanctuaries, to areas that were before seen as areas that were not safe for animals. So those areas became safe for animals during that period, and they still continue to be safe. And most importantly, those people who all the time are in the field or ranges, you know, taking care of animals, could have some sleep at least at night, like the rest of the people sleep during the night, because probably poaching threat went down, yeah, and they also had time to see their families. So what I can say as a success is that when you have success is when you have your births exceed deaths, deaths that could be due to natural causes or due to man uh, uh, um, uh, activities. So that's when I can say, yes, we have uh, success, but exceeding deaths and the habitats also safe enough to, uh, uh, to, 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 to keep them. Thank you, Ben. Thanks. Um, can I put the same question, please, to uh, Dr. Bibhav Talukdar from Aranyak in Assam? And Bibhav has several roles. Uh, could you ch chat at the, uh, introduce yourself briefly? Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I am Bilal Talukdar. I have been associated with wildlife conservation since 1989. That's the time I was one of the founders of Aranyak based in Guwahati. I am currently the chair of the Asian Rhino Specialist Group, and I am also the senior advisor on Asian Rhinos for International Rhino Foundations. So my association with wildlife started, you know, as I mentioned in 1989. Uh, and in terms of rhino conservation, I have been involved with rhino conservation since 1996 onwards, almost the time which Ben was mentioning about. And in my, you know, 30 years of, you know, working in the field of wildlife, I have seen ups and down. Uh, however, fortunately, the greater one-horned rhino in both India and Nepal has witnessed, you know, increase despite some, you know, bad phases uh, it has uh, to face due to prolonged socio-political unrest. But this is also one of the species that could be downlisted from IUCN red list to the vulnerable category. And that reverberates, you know, the proactive actions being, you know, uh, practiced by the ranch country governments, assisted by NGOs and other conservation agents. To me, you know, the numbers are important, definitely. We still don't know, you know, what is a good number, but in, in our discussions in, in recently, at least I feel, you know, 5,000 rhinos probably by 2030, you know, would be a good number to achieve. But along with the numbers, we also need space. So, you know, I think we should not forget the space, the area is also important along with the numbers of rhinos. Okay, thank you, Bibhav. Um, Mike, can I turn to you next, please? Thanks, Kathy, and hello, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Sasrolfus, and uh, I'm a researcher at the Oxford Martin Programme on Wildlife Trade, which is at Oxford University. And I also work as a policy consultant, and I'm also a member of the African Rhino Specialist Group. My um, involvement with rhinos dates back to around 1989, when, like Ben, as an undergraduate student, I, um, I looked at rhino management issues, but more from a, a, an economic perspective. And I've followed that trajectory ever since, looking at the um, the economic, the social science aspects of, of rhinos, um, rhino conservation, rhino management, um, and doing quite a lot of work on researching the rhino horn trade and how to deal with that. Um, just to echo what the what the two previous speakers have said, I think uh, uh, rhino success is is uh, made up of of three elements really. It's it's uh, we, ideally, we want wild rhinos in, in uh, their natural habitat playing an ecologically functional role, um, but they also need to be safe and secure. They need to be protected from, from poaching. And, um, and then thirdly, we want their populations to be growing. Um, uh, new births, ex rap rapid growth is ideal from a rhino conservation perspective. So if we can get all those three factors working together, then I would say that that constitutes successful conservation. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. And then uh, to Raoul, please, same question. Raoul, have we got you? Are we struggling with mute? I've muted myself. Hi, everybody. I'm Raoul de Toy. I'm director of the Lowford Rhino Trust in Zimbabwe. That's a small NGO that operates mainly in southern Zimbabwe, although we also do some regional work. 
um, and we do hands-on monitoring and management of rhinos, including translocations and, and other interventions. Um, I started with the African Rhino Specialist Group uh, way back in 1986. Uh, and when I was offered the job as scientific officer with that group, I didn't initially wish to take it because I felt that uh, single species conservation of an animal like a rhino would be a bit of a strange career path. Um, and instead I came to realize that um, rhino conservation is a very holistic um, issue. And to, to deal with all the challenges to rhinos, one has to grapple with a wide range of socioeconomic, political, land use, economic issues of one kind or another that really bring one to the cutting edge of, of, of wildlife conservation. And, and that's proven to be the case. And that leads on to my uh, comment on what I would see as successful rhino conservation, which is essentially maintaining large viable populations. And I'm talking about populations of over a hundred in each in areas large enough to meet the full ecological requirements and carry all other biodiversity along with it. Um, with some prospect of a return on investment of those rhinos in those areas. Uh, a bit like a financial investment, you do your due diligence, you can never uh, absolutely guarantee total success, but as long as the ingredients are there for a measure of success that results in more rhinos being, being added over time than a loss through inevitable poaching, attrition or other factors, then I think we're winning. Thanks. Okay, thank you everybody. So we've had various definitions of success, but I think quite a lot of agreement between the panel members between Africa and Asia. In this next section of, of, of today's Thorny Issues Live, I'm going to first ask, we'll go through three big questions, which are, are there numerical targets for each rhino species? Are all rhinos equal? as others of the same species? And how many rhinos do we think we really want or need? Um, at, there will be time at the end for questions from the audience. Some of you have submitted questions in advance and we will try to address uh, a few of those as we go through. But whether you're watching on Facebook, Facebook or YouTube, use the chat function, sign in on it using your account and use the chat functions to post your questions and people from Save the Rhino will be going through those and we'll, we'll get, deal with as many as we can. If they are not strictly about the subject, then colleagues will try to re respond. I think we've had a few questions in about dehorning and where are the consumer countries and so on. Those would be dealt with in the chat rather than by the panel members. So our first section is to talk about are there numerical targets per species or subspecies? Are these defined in national rhino strategies? And I'm going to ask Raoul to begin just to introduce us to the concept of national rhino strategies and, and what kind of performance indicators they use. So um, Raoul. Okay, um, you know, the first um, elaboration of a national rhino strategy was actually here in Zimbabwe way back uh, at the height of the poaching in the late 1980s, when a lot of money was being spent in confronting a cross-border poaching crisis. But um, there were legitimate queries about what the long-term strategy was, just chucking money at a, a daily anti-poaching activity, which can get pretty expensive. Um, you know, it's not really a guarantee of any success. You need to understand where you're going in the long run. So there was a lot of pressure to develop a national rhino strategy here. And since then, the poach has been elaborated um, in, in, I would say, uh, a fairly standardized way uh, in many senses for, for different countries. Generally, national rhino strategy has got a fixed period of application, uh, three to five years generally. And the targets are generally based on uh, looking at the current numbers of rhinos and then looking at uh, achieving a, a benchmark annual growth rate over a number of years to end up at a certain number of rhinos after that period. And generally the growth rate is set at around 3%, which gives some balance between the potential growth rate of African rhino populations in suitable wild habitats without population compression, which is around 10%, and some poaching losses or other constraints and optimum growth. But I'd just like to mention that even more important, in my view, than numerical targets in a national rhino strategy are uh, well thought out indicators of performance, key performance indicators that are reviewed annually. Um, otherwise, if a numerical target is set and isn't met after a period of, of, of the national rhino strategy, 
The deficit is likely just to be shrugged off as due to factors beyond our control or whatever. Whereas instead, if you do annual reviews and you look critically at the KPIs relating to running demography and law enforcement effort and other factors, that provides stimulation for ongoing corrective action. So you end up um, ultimately uh, being more successful. Thanks. Thanks, Raoul. Uh, ben, I think that feed, leads nicely into you because uh, you've been involved with the production of a number of Kenyan uh, five-year strategies. And uh, during the most recent five-year term, there was the midterm review of, of performance against the targets. I wanted to ask you in particular, for as long as I can remember, Kenya has had a long-term vision of 2,000 black rhinos in Kenya. And I wondered if you could sort of talk about how that figure was arrived at. Yeah, thanks. I think uh, the 2,000 has been uh, more like uh, a magic uh, a magic visionary target. And uh, magic here in the sense that uh, uh, when we hit that number, then uh, we will be in a position that we can say now we have a minimum viable population uh, that can withstand you know, various perturbations, be it environmental issues, be it genetic issues, you know, be it uh, natural catastrophes and you know, demographic issues. So uh, arriving at this number, uh, there was uh, some population viability analysis that was done, you know, looking at all those factors that I've mentioned, you know, environment, genetics, etc. Yeah, and uh, uh, based on that kind of modeling, we came to the 2000 as the minimum viable that can be sustained in the longer term, yeah, uh, 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 in terms of rhino conservation, and also with the higher probability that you know they can withstand you know those challenges that pose threat to their survival. So it's a uh, 2000 that time, but we also have to appreciate that recent uh, uh, population uh, viability analysis and uh, minimum viable. Uh, populations, you know, come uh, give a, a figure of about five to seven thousand animals for other species also. So this is a number that can uh, be revised upwards. But as I said earlier, it's a magic number that once we hit it, then uh, we will be at a, a position that we can say with high probability of certainty that the numbers we have in Kenya can withstand, you know, this challenges that pose threat to them. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to say that if there are these long-term visions, five-year plans often set intermediate goals for how many rhinos they hope to have in at the end of the next five-year period to give you sort of intermediate targets. Um, Mike, um, the, many national strategies don't just cover rhino numbers and have law enforcement KPIs or monitoring key performance indicators. Um, did, could you talk about what else a good national strategy should include? Kathy, sure. So um, obviously um, a major concern at the moment, with, again, with the resurgent poaching crisis of the last decade or so is, is, is the security of, of the animals. And their overall quality of life. So, um, in in devising a national plan, um, you, you not only need to consider which are the best habitats um, and and best situations for the rhinos um, in, in, ecologically, but you you also need to take in economic and security uh, concerns into account. So there are financial issues, um, and in just about all these successful rhino range states, um, this has also meant partnerships with non-state actors. So we see um, private landowners playing uh, a, a role as custodians um, and uh, sometimes even owning rhinos themselves. Um, and they need to be incentivized in perhaps somewhat slightly different ways from uh, 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 state actors who have national parks budgets that they can spend, um, but are also sometimes challenged. So um, a, a sensible strategy needs to take all these factors into account, the, the economic, the financial, uh, and incorporate them. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky optimization exercise, if I can put it that way. Yeah. Um, and Bipab, can I turn to you? Because um, not so much a national strategy, but uh, Assam developed a, a strategy with very specific targets and so on. Could you talk to us a bit about that and whether you think it was helpful? for rhino conservation efforts? 
Thank you, Cathy. I think Assam in 2005, when the Indian Rhino Vision 2020 was launched, our target was to have you know, 3,000 rhinos within Assam by year 2020, and also distribute rhinos in some earlier you know, habitats within Assam, so that you know, we have uh, the, the habitat also being addressed, you know, being conserved. So we are quite close to 3,000. Our last official estimation of greater one horn rhino in Assam was uh, in 2018, and we had about 2,650. But since 2018, 18 until 2020, there was no estimation. So to my, you know, gut feeling, the population may have come close to 2,800 or 2,900. So estimation process will be done this year in, in Assam uh, in 2021. But target definitely helps us to achieve, you know, uh, and this also help us to review the conservation practice or conservation measures, you know, those are useful, those needs to be you know, changed depending on the new challenges that we are facing. Uh, I would also like to highlight that in 2019, the Indian government also launched the national strategy. In our national strategy, number has not been given emphasis. Rather, in by 2030, our national strategy says that we will put you know, rhinos in 5% more area than in the existing area. So, you know, that is one of the goal of the, you know, the national strategy and the, to achieve those goals, you know, we'll have protection measures, we'll have transboundary cooperations, we'll have research on habitat and, you know, the populations, and we'll also, you know, opt for the, the grants expansion within India initially. And then, you know, the, under the transboundary cooperations, you know, there could be future collaborations with the other rhino race countries, you know, specifically to get a one on right. Yeah, so there's quite a lot of common ground in terms of uh, it's good to have a plan and to set targets, but as important is to review your progress and to address any difficulties. I can certainly say from a donor organization point of view that uh, we would very much take, um, uh, if a country has a current plan, that is being signed off, that is being reviewed, we would see that of evidence of a national government commitment to rhino conservation efforts. And uh, unfortunately, there are quite a few range state countries that don't have current plans where previous ones of it have, have expired and not been renewed. And it, it's frustrating because you can't all be sure that you're working towards a common goal. Your donor organizations want to be confident that they're investing their hard uh, earned funds, thanks to their supporters, into the right project. So yes, yeah, certainly from our point of view, strategies are very useful. I have a question I'd like to bring in from James Mugisha in Uganda, and Ben, I might direct this to you. Uh, James asked whether uh, thinking specifically of Zewa Rhino Sanctuary, which has the only viable population of white rhinos in Uganda at the moment. He asks, does, do you, does one have to have a national rhino strategy before rhinos could be released into the wild? And how would stakeholders be involved? Perhaps, Ben, you've been involved in the development of the Uganda plan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question, James. I think uh, it is uh, uh, important to have a plan. And uh, from these plans, the way we've discussed uh, uh, the importance of plans and how they steer your, your successes, for you to be able to steer your successes and to be able to galvanize resources that are required for managing your population, it's very important to have a plan. And uh, with this plan, you can be able, like Raul had said, you have the key performance indicators, you can be able to measure your successes and uh, you can be able to correct where things probably are not going right. Yeah, so uh, it, it's, it's not, uh, it may not be so much a precondition, but it is a condition that <laughs> you should have, you know, going forward. And uh, within that plan, again, you can uh, 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 be able to um, articulate how best communities can be involved in uh, supporting, you know, your initiative in uh, Zewa and its surroundings. Thanks, Ben, Th and thank you, everybody. So let's move on to the, the the second big question, which is: Is every rhino equally as important uh, as others of the same species or subspecies? So, just by way of illustration, for example, when the African Rhino Specialist Group is preparing 
um, the rhino population data for the CITES meetings, it doesn't include rhino numbers um, that are out of range. So, for, for example, rhinos held in European or American zoos. Um, there is discussion of whether sort of uh, po very tiny populations with one or two animals that probably aren't breeding, whether they should be counted. Um, Bipab, I'd like to come to you first because um, you're involved with one of the programs. In, it's the only program we support that does not have what is traditionally regarded as a viable population, and that's the Sumatran rhino sanctuary. Um, could you sort of w talk a bit about the Sumatran rhinos and why it's why some conservation organisations like us think it's important to focus on every birth? Well, I think it is very crucial because we have seen, you know, that the steady decline in, in most of the cases we see steady increase in population, but here we have witnessed almost steady decline, you know, with regards to the Sumatran rhino, rhino, and decline not only in population but also in the range, you know, the areas where they occupied, you know, the space earlier, and the Sumatran rhinos are now extinct in Malaysia. It is now only found in Indonesia, that's also in few pockets too, you know, national parks in southern part and, you know, one big national park or landscape in, in the northern part of Sumatra. And it's because it is a long ranging animal, it's very difficult to estimate. So whatever estimation was done was perhaps inaccurate and that also led to a many conservation challenges. But now at least, you know, based on the you know, camera traps and other footprints data, we know that there could, there could be less than 80 rhinos and that makes you know the, the the effort of of securing the futures of sumatran rhinos is very important time is very important every rhinos are important we really need to look for every options but while you know the conservation breeding has been playing an important role especially in sumatran rhino sanctuaries it gets you know a couple of birds of late uh, but at the same time, you know, the isolated populations perhaps need proper management, it could be, you know, used for conservation breeding or bring it to another areas where, you know, the bull rhinos can get opportunities to breed. So time is very important. And I think the IUCN SSC along with partners like International Rhino Foundation, uh, WWF, they have initiated the Sumatran Rhino Rescue Project in active, you know, participation of the Indonesian government. Um, you know, let us hope that, you know, the the, the isolated populations could be could be tracked down. Those populations could be used, you know, even in conservation breeding center. But at the same time, I would also insist that conservation efforts in the wilderness where we have viable populations still intact should also get priority. Thanks, Bibhav. So Ben, there's a, a kind of an interesting contrast uh, situation in, in, in Kenya where you have the last two, what, what is believed to be the last two northern white rhinos left oh. in the world. Now, Save the Rhino, when we were first formed, we, we did support the wild population in Garamba National Park. But in 2006, when it was reckoned there were only maybe four, four, four or five animals left, at that point, we decided not to put any more funding into Garamba. And we've not participated or supported efforts to for artificial breeding of the two remaining northern whites can i ask what's what's your opinion when what when do you when should one decide to, that a subspecies is doomed and to stop putting effort into that what what how, what do you feel well <laughs> that's an interesting one because uh, uh, this now is a matter that you know touches that uh, at our hearts and not so much our minds. And uh, if you look at uh, uh, the issues that have led to the decline of these animals, they are issues that are man-driven. Yeah, some of these uh, southern white, northern white rhinos, sorry, that uh, you talk about, you know, there were plenty in Central Africa, you know, down to places like Uganda and South Sudan. Yeah, and we have none now that we know of in the wild. And if you look at the history of uh, the, uh, the reasons why they declined is mainly because of probably unrest in certain areas or uh, uh, lack of taking appropriate conservation actions and implementing conservation policies you know, uh, upon uh, uh, proper advice. Yeah, so there are all things which are man-induced. Uh, and therefore, man has the responsibility. We have the responsibility 
to make sure that um, uh, we reverse these uh, troubles that we've caused to these animals. And, uh, and um, uh, that responsibility uh, should not uh, be gauged in a way that you can say, now population is doomed, let us stop. No, 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 we should think of it as a living creature that has a right to live, just like we put a lot of efforts to ensure that you know, man as a species also lives. We should also put efforts to ensure that you know, the species that we contribute to their decline you know, also get a chance to live. So what I can say in a nutshell is, don't be discouraged, put in more money to ensure that we do the right thing for these animals. The rewilding, for example, is going on all over. The yeah, man realizing that, you know, we did a you know, serious mistake to nature. Let us do rewilding, let us do green areas. So the same way to these species, we should make all efforts that we can within our means and our capacity and capability to bring them back. Thanks, Ben. So, Raoul, I think you've also talked in the past about the problem of problem, if I can call it that, of, of small populations and and whether they are really sort of able to maximize breeding efforts. Would you be able to expand on that a bit? Sure. I mean, I think it's beyond um, any argument that every rhino is important and has got a conservation value. But if you look at this very objectively in conservation biology terms. Um, it has to be said that the value of each rhino is not equal. A wild rhino that's interacting with other rhinos and elements of a natural ecosystem obviously has the highest uh, value in terms of adding to the ecology of the area and to the evolution of the species. And, and as we touched on already, it, it also acts as a, you know, it, it, within a, the, 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 the rhino species as a flagship umbrella um, by virtue of the fact that the security needs and size of the area required for a viable wild population, you know, concurrently meet the needs of a wide range of other species and also maintain ecosystem processes. So rhinos, wild rhinos are pivotal components of natural capital. The rhinos in captivity obviously still have a species value and one could say it's an educational value as well, also a kind of insurance value. But that insurance value is a potential value rather than a current value and current value is always more critical than potential values. And if I can say that one lesson I've learned in my 35 odd years of involvement in rhino conservation is that we've tended to focus far too much on um, emotional allocations of resources to rhinos, on the individuals and personalities involved in those efforts. And we haven't focused nearly enough on the fundamental conservation biology attributes uh, that govern the, the viability of these populations. And we've doomed many rhinos um, to, to non-viable futures by applying in lots of funding and emotional effort into, into dead ends, I'm sorry to say. Um, I'd also just like to mention that it's important to note the differences within Africa where there's a lot of focus on the poaching um, between black and white rhinos. White rhinos have been bred very successfully under intensive management, uh, not quite zoos, but certainly with a, um, control over their, uh, their feeding and their reproduction, et cetera. And those breeders who built up those populations certainly deserve a lot of credit for that success. They've outperformed zoo breeding by orders of magnitude. But we mustn't forget that black rhinos can't be farmed. And it's therefore very dangerous to equate the two species. Black rhinos are from a, a, a behavioral and ecological point of view, much more complicated. And also because of, the, of um, you know, looking at the fact that there are three times as many white rhinos as black rhinos, so black rhinos have an added rarity value. So just at a species level, I don't think one can say the conservation value of blacks and whites is, is directly equivalent. Thanks, Raoul. Uh, um, Mike, uh, perhaps I could ask you to, to focus on the South African situation. We talked earlier about Kruger National Park and, and the steep drop in numbers there. And obviously South Africa is where the private rhino owners have had very successful breeding operations of, of white rhinos. Is, it, is there something uh, sort of worth teasing out there about genetic values of, of these intensively managed populations? It, I think, well, yes. So just uh, firstly, just to, to um, echo everything that Raoul said, uh, you know, I think what, what, what he said was really important and viewed in that context, we then need to, we need to look at the South African situation very critically. And um, 
the, the, the problem we face is that the most valuable, uh, ecologically valuable population in South Africa, which is the largest population of black and white rhinos in, in, in Kruger Park, is very difficult to monitor and it's difficult to exclude and difficult to deter poaching. And we've seen the consequence of that. So we have this perverse situation where the numbers are really building up um, in more intensive intensively managed areas where they are perhaps not as ecologically functional or, or don't have as high conservation value, but they might end up being um, constituting a very valuable arc. Um, and so we need to we need to plan for that in some way. And uh, we obviously want to get out of that situation as soon as possible and get back to a wilder situation. But in, in, in the interim, we need to be pragmatic. Uh, also to the main question of this, this, this second question, we, um, we've really had to confront this captive wild continuum in South Africa because it really is a continuum from one extreme to the other. And we can say quite confidently at, at either extreme, well, this is good and this is, this is not ideal. Um, but there are, lots of, there are lots of intermediary situations and it's very difficult to know where to draw the line. Well, you know, once, when have rhinos crossed the line from being valuable to conservation to being not? At the moment, I think we're still interpreting that quite liberally. Um, but if, if rhinos had to uh, persist in captive or semi-captive conditions for, uh, for several generations, that would, uh, our view on that would change. So our challenge is to get them out of that situation as, as soon as possible, but we, we need to be pragmatic about that. Thanks, Mike. I'd like to throw in a question that came in from Michelle Barda in France, who asks, can zoo rhinos seriously contribute to wild populations? Would one of you like to answer that question? Um, I, and I mean, they've really contributed. Some, some zoo rhinos have been moved to situations, particularly in uh, uh, where there's small populations to reinforce those populations and add additional genetic diversity. Um, so it, it can be done. It's not easy though. Behaviorally, when, it, when I'm talking about black rhinos here, it's, it's, it's actually quite complicated to integrate rhinos into, into, into wild populations. So there's a lot of cost and expense involved in simply saying we've raised a rhino in our, in our small population um, please take it and put it back in the wild and we'll feel we've done our bit. That's actually handing quite a big problem on to someone else who has to integrate that animal. And as I said, certainly with black rhinos, it's really achieved successfully, but there have been some cases. Um, and it's, it's not, it's completely uh, uh, unreasonable to suggest that there can be some genetic infusion from some wild, some, some zoo populations into wild populations. So off the top of my head, I can think that four of the animals that originally went to Zewa Rhino Sanctuary in Uganda came from Disney Animal Kingdom in the States. Uh, I think they were supplemented by a couple from Solio Ben. Uh, and then more recently, I can remember black rhinos that have gone from zoos in um, Europe and in the USA, some to Mukamazi Rhino Sanctuary in Tanzania, some to Grometi Reserve in Tanzania, and then also to Akagera National Park in in Rwanda, where they are, uh, they're trying to um, manage the reintroductions between the zoo bred animals and the wild, the wild animals by literally putting them at opposite ends of the park and over a, a period of years, and perhaps the calves of the of the current rhinos might one day meet in the middle and start doing that sharing of, of the gene pool. Bibhab, has it, has anything been done in Indian rhinos? So did I hear occasionally that? Um, wild animals go out into villages and are then captured and moved to zoos. Is there any transfer of zoo animals back to the wild? But so far, you know, zoo animals back to the wild in, in terms of Indian condition, uh, you know, it's, it's not happening because rather, you know, sometimes when the, the wild animals stay out and then their health conditions are not good and they are put into a zoo and then those animals are exchanged with other zoos as per the standard protocol. Uh, now, coming to, you know, the overall conservation scenarios with the rhinos, you know, because when rhinos stay out, you know, it's the cooperation of the local peoples are very important so that the rhinos are safe. You know, in my, you know, 30 years of experience, whenever rhinos stayed out, I have never heard that rhino was killed by people. You know, so that's because of, you know, the conservation awareness that has been, you know, put across, you know, the communities. The community feels quite right. 
In fact, the you know, rhino conservation is an epitome of conservation movement in Assam. Every people in Assam is proud of having rhinos in our own provinces. So that kind of, I think, feelings needs to be, you know, increased among the communities because communities, you know, voice as heard by the government and it can further accelerate and complement the effort of the government. So that is a very important, you know, aspect that we all rhino conservationists probably needs to look at wherever, you know, it is feasible to engage communities in a proactive conservation. Thank you, Bibhav. Um, Raul, can I toss one more question to you? Uh, it came in from Sue Chimes, who asked, why can't black rhinos be farmed? Well, behaviorally, um, they, they're a little bit more complicated than white rhinos, which tend to, to move in groups um, and uh, are, are much more, almost like herd animals in a way. Black rhinos are not totally solitary. Um, to describe them as solitary aggressive animals is too simplistic, but their social interactions um, are very different to white rhinos. Um, they also need um, a, a, a range of, of browse species for a balanced kind of diet um, and um, inherently are far more difficult to, to ensure that diet for than white rhinos who can be you know, fed pretty well on, on the kind of <laughs> Um, pastures that you would you would use for for normal uh, normal, normal cattle. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to move on to the third question, which is, how many rhinos do we really want or need? I mean, and uh, and in particular, does the answer depend on how rhinos are perceived, on what kind of values we place or attribute to them? Um, Raoul, to begin with you, um, I think you've talked about uh, right, the importance of rhinos as flagship or umbrella species, and you said in your introduction about large viable wild populations. Would you like to expand on that a little? Sure. I mean, the extent to which a country in its national rhino strategy makes an effort to use those rhinos as flagship or umbrella species for um, enhancing uh, the status of protected areas, attracting funding, um, improving security, et cetera, is obviously varies from place to place. But, um, and, and that will determine how many rhinos that country really feels they want. They may want only a, a few in a situation where they're just trying to enhance or develop some particular park um, and get that going and then worry about what you may do from there in 20 years' time. Um, but, you know, I come back to the point that it's fundamentally the conservation biology issues, and Ben discussed the concept of minimum viable populations, which in very simple terms is the smallest number that you're going to need for the population to have a chance of long-term persistence under natural breeding. That depends on the ratio between what we call the effective population size and the total population size. Effective population size, or any being the uh, number of, of animals that are successfully breeding in that population, the successful breeders. Um, and the ratio of the effective breeders to the total population is something that we're still trying to determine. Uh, it's very frustrating when we, as low for Rhino Trust, we've got hundreds of samples, genetic samples we've collected over the years from the many hundreds of rhinos that we've, that we've, we've, we've handled in one way or another. But we've remained very frustrated in getting the pedigree analyses done and getting the geneticists to cooperate with us on um, putting aside their own academic ambitions that they always want to rush off with when it comes to our samples and get on with this routine work of, of, of helping us with the bridge analysis. But we were working on it. I'd just like to make the point that if you have smaller uh, numbers of rhinos that in, in themselves are, are not genetically viable, um, the term metapopulation is often used. Metapopulation meaning that you've got managed gene flow between different populations, you're moving animals around. But as we just pointed out, it's not so easy socially to move these animals around. Um, and rhinos are um, animals with uh, interactions with family and with other rhinos that they know that are very strong and, and they're breeding and, 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 and uh, the general welfare of those animals is heavily impacted when you disturb them by just shuffling them around like chess pieces on a board. So I think that's, that's a lesson that's being learned in translocation metapopulation management. It's not so easy. So let's go for the biggest populations we can. Um, and really uh, appreciate that ultimately there are repositories uh, for the genetic diversity and ongoing evolution of the species. Thank you, Raoul. Ben, is there anything you'd like to add on sort of the values or 
or, or the purpose of the rhinos? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, in addition to what uh, Raul just talked about, you know, having uh, these animals as a uh, iconic or flagship uh, species, cornerstone species, you know, it's also important to us to realize that we are still in that recovery phase of um, rhino population. So all efforts that we make, we have to make them in a way that um, we are aiming at, you know, increasing numbers. And uh, also not just increasing numbers, but also ensuring that the habitats within which those numbers you know, can uh, uh, exist is also kept to the highest integrity possible. Yeah, so there are, there are other benefits that uh, will make us want to, to have as many rhinos as we can during this recovery phase. Yeah, the ecological uh, side of things, ecological benefits, yeah, which uh, we have to look into, uh, which could be in the form of those, uh, even things like ecosystem services that we so much enjoy, carbon sequestrations, for example, yeah, uh, uh, things like uh, dispersal of uh, seeds, etc., from an ecological point of view. Yeah, there are also other benefits which uh, we want to keep associated with, which can be cultural in nature. Yeah, there could be other benefits which could be economic in nature that we derive from these animals, either directly or indirectly, you know, through tourism, for example. Yeah, and uh, and uh, uh, before you talk of how many within a space, for example, do you need? We also have to think of, uh, given the fact that we are in the recovery phase, you have to think of, you want to keep them in a way that they are not themselves causing trouble to themselves. In other words their densities and concentration within a certain area does not have impact to their uh, their growth. So you manage them in a way that uh, you observe that uh, density dependent um, uh, issues that arise from uh, crowding. Yeah, and uh, the fact that uh, they are uh, large uh, mammals, uh, the main enemy is uh, man. Yeah, they don't have uh, serious predators to uh, take them off, so they are mainly food dependent and controlled in you know, a bottom up. Yeah, so because of that, that habitat has to be in a condition that can take as many as possible. So yeah, we can have many as many rhinos as uh, the suitable and available habitat can take. Thank you, Ben. And Bipab, you've already talked about the sort of the cultural pride that the people of Sam have in their in their greater one horned rhinos. I think I've also seen newspaper reports about political parties using their support for rhino conservation as, as a vote winner. Could you talk a little about that? Yeah, definitely. I think you know the rhino issues came into political parties' main domain since 2014. And 2012-13, we had a pick in the rhino poaching cases when it touches 41. But because of the voice of the people, government, you know, had to act. And now last year, there was only two poaching. So from 41 to two, you know, in a span of 10 years is a good achievement, not only for the government, but also for the people also. Okay, this is because of, you know, their approach attachment with the rhinos. So to me, you know, along with the numbers, habitat conservation is very important, which, which also needs a, you know, proactive thinking. And people's voice always matters. So as long as you know we can generate people's voice, the political leadership does listen to people's. If not every day, at least in once in four years or five years, you know, when they really need the support of the people to be remain in the power or you know to exercise their you know political career. Maybe we should have national elections every year. Then heaven help us. <laughs> Keep it at the top of the agenda. Um, Mike, Ben touched on economic aspects, but uh, given your interest, can I ask you to expand on that, please? Sure, Cathy. Well, just to, again, agree with all the previous speakers, there is a full spectrum of values and uh, ranging from the argument that rhinos have intrinsic value, which is quite independent of what we as humans may think of them, um, through to, to the more instrumental values, um, the ecosystem services that they provide um, by way of the ecologically functional role, <coughs> Um, but then there are, um, we, we still face this problem that we need to, um, 
we need to incentivize rhino management on the ground. We need to win the goodwill of local people. And sometimes we need to generate, we actually need to generate finance to pay for rhino protection. Um, and then the ways of doing that are, are capturing the, the values. Now, so, something like a, an, an ecological value, a, 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 an ecosystem services value is difficult to, is difficult to capture. Uh, financially, you have to you have to set up international uh, mechanisms to do that. Um, there are more direct me mechanisms like um, uh, rhino-based tourism, for example. And then, of course, somewhat controversially, um, the countries like Namibia and South Africa that have been very successful in conserving their rhinos have also used um, tro tr selective trophy hunting, um, legal trophy hunting, which has also generated funds and um, and helped as well. But obviously, that's 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 a controversial issue. But we we have to recognize that um, rhinos have different values to different people, including some instrumental values. And arguably, it's it's uh, it's a value that some people place on their horn that is uh, creating many of the problems for rhino conservation. And we need to deal with that in in some constructive way as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mike. So uh, uh, lots of values for rhinos. Lots of reasons for wanting to conserve them. I've had a, a series of questions in that are, that, are, that are about sort of the threats to rhino range expansion and if I can try and put them together. Um, so Nick Lindsay, for example, from the UK has talked about there are a very big greater one horn populations in Chitwanago and Hattie uh, in Assam, but the habitat is threatened by invasive plant species, uh, Lantana and the uh, Mycanthra, Mycania and Mycanthra, I think. Um, John in the UK has asked about projections of human population growth and a tripling per even of the population in Africa. Um, Michaela asked about the impacts of climate change and uh, Janet um, in the UK also asked about perhaps if there are declining populations of lions which have predated on rhino calves in some area, does that provide an opportunity for more rhinos, fewer lions, but then what about the threats of invasive species, of, of climate change and of human population growth? What does that mean in terms of all our ambitions for rhino growth? Who would like to tackle this knotty subject first? Raoul, I can see you leaning forward. I'll take one of the one of the ones that I can deal with quickly, which is the lion predation issue. Yes, uh, rhinos can sometimes lose um, calves to to predators, uh, actually more often to hyenas than to lions, and that's because. Uh, certainly black rhinos will often leave their calves hidden while they go to water and if a pack of hyenas comes across the calf then then they'll get it. But generally rhinos are pretty savvy when it comes to dealing with predators. Um, in Ruby Valley Conservancy, Conservancy, which is our largest population in, of rhinos in Zimbabwe, we have the li highest lion density in Africa and uh, those, those rhinos are breeding just fine. Uh, they deal with the lions. Thanks. But um, Bibhab, maybe I could ask you about invasive species, given that that's a big problem in Chitwan National Park and other parks in where the greater one horned rhinos are found. Yeah, I think this is very true. We always notice poaching because it is visible. We see blood, you know, our attention goes more to in the prevention of poaching. But along with poaching, the threat from invasive species are also increasing. So this is time that we also put our resources, our you know manpowers to really look into how best biologically you know these invasive species could be controlled. This has been a challenge on, in Chitwan of late. This has been a challenge even in in the rhino bearing areas in, in within India. So I think invasive this should be a priority. Unfortunately, you know, our government has taken this as a priority because poaching has been declined. We can afford time to put into habitat management. Same like this for the, for the you know, Javan right. We have seen how a small intervention of controlling Aranga Palm in Ujumplan National Park in 2010 has enabled, you know, the Javan rhinos to increase their population to 74. So I think habitat management is key and that is where the scientific, you know, interventions can play a very important role. Can I ask ben, uh, ben or Mike, would you care to comment on the climate change aspect and what does that mean? 
coaching crisis for the last 12 years and that sometimes and that long-term visioning and planning has suffered as a result yeah maybe um something on climate change i think is also so much linked to what uh, uh the previous speakers have spoken about invasive species in some of these areas and uh, this has been also attributed to changes in climate in certain areas where parks or uh, rhino reserves have been designated yeah and it is a uh, uh, something that uh, of course as we we studied and understand the trends it is something that we also have to you know, just uh, tackle yeah, practically and mitigate on the ground yeah, just to add on also the uh, the, the the invasive uh, plant issues is one of those things that uh, 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 we are still grappling with. Uh, when I was a rhino coordinator in Kenya Wildlife Service, we incorporated that under our biological management side of things. Yeah, and uh, uh, to come up with uh, means and ways of eradicating them or controlling them in areas where they start to take up habitats and food resources for rhinos. Yeah, and some of this is related to you know, changes in climate. Yeah, some of it is related to human disturbance. Yeah. And uh, some of these human disturbance are also uh, sometimes driven by reaction to effects of climate. They want to move to areas where they can do agriculture or where they can get access to food and uh, water and other resources. And the process, you know, the effect just keeps on uh, escalating and compounding and uh, it is something that has to be you know, tackled in. If I just comment, yeah, Rob, can, can I just comment very quickly, point. very quick, I know we're running short of time, but I think a huge uh, alert that has to be sounded is to do with climate change and sea level rise that's going to affect the fertile uh, river deltas in, in, in Asia and is going to compress populations and require them to move. Uh, we're talking about many, many, many people who are going to have to find somewhere to live because their homes are going to be flooded. And I think that a bit of scenario analysis in terms of what that's going to mean for or Indian rhinos is, 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 is essential. Yeah. Mike, is there anything you'd like to add in terms of population growth? No, <laughs> it's such a big, it's such a big subject. Um, everybody, we're coming to the end of this session. Um, if I may, could I ask you, uh, each panel member in, in turn, just to come up with a, a closing sort of sentence or thought in terms of how many rhinos do we need to save? And are there any reasons to be cheerful? Let's try and end on a positive note. Um, Mike, I'll start with you. Well, Kathy, we should we should obviously save all the rhinos that we can. Um, our, our challenge is to prioritize and figure out how. But I do want to leave with a, with, a, with a positive note and just to remind all our viewers that in the year 1900, the world's rarest rhino subspecies or species were the southern white rhino. There were less than 50 animals left in a single protected area. And now it is the world's most abundant species. So it can be done. There's hope. And maybe we can learn from that and draw, draw inspiration from that. That's the kind of graph I like to see. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Vipad, can I turn to you, please, on behalf of the Asian rhinos? Well, I think in terms of greater one horned rhino, if we get 5,000 by 2030, that would be a very good, you know, rhino population for India and Nepal. Uh, Javan rhino, currently we have 74. In next 10 years' time, even if it could be double, at least, you know, close to 150, it could be a good, you know, viable population. So, Matran rhino, of course, you know, it has to face, you know, face the challenges. But despite the challenges, you know, if we can at least retain it to 80 to 100, in like that 10 years, you know, so that the population build up process can be further enhanced. That would be a very good, you know, effort. Along with the numbers, I feel we should not, you know, lose the existing land, which are demarcated for rhinos. As long as land is there, there is a possibilities to play long innings. But if we lose land along with the populations, you know, then I think future will be more challenging. Yeah, great point, Bibhav. Thank you. Um, ben, from you. Yeah, thank you. I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot of hope and uh, there's still a, a lot of room to get things uh, better. And uh, we've seen numbers uh, grow from, uh, you know, very low numbers, uh, which we had in the 80s, 
and some populations have doubled in some of the areas. We've seen areas which were not secure now being made available to rhinos, and we've seen a lot of growing interest in the rhino conservation amongst people. That's the kind of tempo I think that we need to keep. And uh, the more we keep it, I think uh, we'll be able to achieve what we want with the rhinos. Thanks, Ben. And, and Raoul, I'll give you the last word. I think we've said quite a lot already about the need to to get away from allocations of rhinos and drips and drabs and to rather build up large viable populations of what we call in Zimbabwe rhino factories. That's where you're going to get your growth and your reproduction. But I'd just like to make the point that we shouldn't actually leave any rhino behind. Um, there's a bit of a tendency that I've seen recently uh, for some of the populations that are building up to say, well, sometimes we've got to let nature take its course when a rhino gets hammered by another bull and maybe should be put in a pen for treatment or whatever. And I, I don't agree with that because rhinos um, are too valuable to allow nature just to take their course, take its course with them. Our human interference has put them where they are and sometimes we need to interfere as humans uh, in their survival um, at an at a individual veterinary level. Um, and looking at the importance of individuals, just to give you an example, We've got a rhino cow called Siobua, black rhino cow. I caught her as the last survivor in a very large region of southern, of, of uh, south of Lake Reba, 1992. That was 29 years ago. It was a massive effort, including a 27 hour nonstop truck trip to move her to southern Zimbabwe. She's had at least nine calves, probably 10 since then. And we've just found tracks of another small calf in her area, which is, I'm pretty sure, another calf of hers. Um, so, you know, if we hadn't caught her, there would be a lot less rhinos around because now she's had uh, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, all the rest of it. At a national level, the fortunes of rhinos go up and down as well. Three decades ago, we had half the number of rhinos, black rhinos in Zimbabwe than we've got now. Last year, there was zero poaching in Kenya as a major range of state, very low poaching in Zimbabwe and Namibia compared to previous years, zero poaching in smaller range states of Zambia, Malawi, Swaziland, so we mustn't just talk about doom and gloom based on the recent very negative picture from South Africa. Other countries have confronted that challenge. And yes, we lose a lot of rhinos, but we can win if, we, if we're strategic about what we do. Thank you, everybody. And it, yeah, just within my time at Save the Rhino, we have, uh, we imagine we've lost the last Northern white rhinos in the wild. Uh, the last Western black rhinos were declared extinct. The subspecies in Sabah in, in, on the island of Borneo have, have been declared extinct, but there have also been successes. Bib have talked about the downlisting of the great one-horned rhino, which is now only vulnerable. It's, it's our organizational and my personal hope that one day the three critically endangered species of rhino, the black, the Sumatran and Javan might be down, downgraded to lower categories of threat. That would be a really great indicator of success so thank you very very much to our panel for your for your thoughts for your impact for your uh, great contributions thank you to the people watching around the world um, a recording of this will be available afterwards for anyone who's had buffering problems and as ever please visit our website sign up for our e-newsletter and we will gladly tell you as much as we can about efforts to support rhino conservation worldwide Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.